Hi everyone, welcome to yet another live class of mine. And this one, um, <laughs> my month of December, let me just preface, my month of December was ridiculously crazy busy. Um, side, side businesses were abundant and then just the regular December craziness, Christmas, family, baking, it all. It all just crashed down. And so this live class, while well, it was supposed to be the week before Christmas on the third Thursday, like I've been doing the rest of them, got pushed back till now. And so you guys get to see my face right before New Year's. So happy New Year's, everybody. I hope 2022 brings us all a little bit more enjoyment than 2021 did. But for this class, we're going to be talking about 4D nail art. And I apologize because I forgot to send out the reminder for everybody today. So I hope, I hope you guys happen to notice this and find me and come say hi anyways. But otherwise, this video, like always, will be kept up to watch in the future. So if you didn't see it when it's live and you're watching it later, it is just as valuable. So in this video, we aren't going to actually be sculpting anything or making anything. We're just going to be talking about kind of the, the ideas behind sculpting things and making them and kind of the steps I go through when I'm coming up with a new design and all of those types of things and some of the supplies. So before we go too far, I'm just going to show you, this is a picture of a kit that I have on my online store and there's a link. Hi Tammy, yeah, and happy new year to you too. Um, thank you, by the way. There is a link in the description box below that has a little purchase place for the items that are in that photo. And if they seem like a confusing thing, like you don't know what they are, it makes sense. It's kind of a weird mix of items. Uh, it's $8 for that kit shipped within the United States. Um, and it's just basic things that I use all the time that are kind of hard to come by or different to come by. They're not the type of things that you'd automatically have in a nail kit because they aren't nail products. Some of them are jewelry supplies, some of them are baking supplies, some of them are mechanics supplies. And so they're the types of things that you won't just logically have in your nail art table. So I have that little kit put together. It's like a little sampling. And if it's something that you think you want, I have only a limited number of these available of what I have available to stick together without completely running myself dry of my own supplies. And so I put those together. If you want one, um, grab it. I probably won't leave them up there on my store for very long just because it's kind of a weird collection of things to just always have available. Um, so probably like a week and otherwise I'll just take them down. So anyways, if that's something that you're interested in, definitely check it out. Like I said, it's $8 and I will quickly just run through what is in it is exactly. So in the top little corner there, or the across the top, that is a pipette, and I'll show you later. But remember, it's a pipette. See, it's one pipette. It's 10 teeny tiny little magnets, 10 red beads, five of those bar wires with the loopy, loop de loop on the end. Or, um, yeah, they're, I don't know what they're called, but they're a wire with a little circle on the end. And then there is some bar beads that are in there. So that's the kit that it comes with. And it's just a nice little mix. I always have the magnets and the pipettes on my online store. So if those are something that you want, you can always just get those separately. But otherwise this little kit puts them all together in just a nice little package so that you get a mix. So there's that, like I said, in case anybody is wanting it or you know if it would be something, I'm trying to get myself more centered on here. That looks better. Okay, even better yet. All right, so now we're just gonna get into it. So beginning with a concept. So when you have an idea, whatever your idea is, and you think, you know what, I wanna make this four dimensional. What can I do? You know, that's usually how I go with. I don't, it's not like a 50-50 shot. Either I have an idea that I know is four dimensional and I know the movement that I want it to make, or I have an idea and I think, you know what, I wanna make this four dimensional. I wanna make it moving. And just to kind of go back a little bit, I wanna describe what I mean when I say 4D or four dimensional because I get questioned this all the time where people are like, why do you say four dimensional? It's not a fourth dimension. There isn't, you know, it's not moving through time and space. No, it's just a convenient way of describing the movement element of it. And I am a stickler for definitions. And so for me to say something that isn't like scientifically correct um, takes a lot out of me. So when I say it's four dimensional, it's because I don't have a better way of explaining it and I'm used to it at this point and that's just how it comes out. So if I ever say 4D, I mean it moves or it changes in some way. There's a element of shift in it, whether it's something that opens or something that pops up or anything like that. It has an element of movement. And that is what I mean when I say 4D. I don't mean that you know it travels into the future and it comes back and it can tell you who the 96th president of the United States is. That's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm just saying that it moves a little bit. 
or a lot depending on the design. So that's what I mean when I say 4D, just to kind of hopefully clarify in case anybody had a question. So you start out with an idea. And you know, your idea might be an ice cream cone. So I'm going to use some real examples in this. So I had an idea, this is an old video and not the best of mine, but I had an idea. I'm like, you know what? I want to make an ice cream cone design because I love just the bright colorfulness, but I want to make it different. I want to make it move. So I made it so that the cone was stationary on the nail and there was a place where the ice cream scoops were tucked into the nail and you could pull it up and it could be one, two, or three scoops depending on how far you pulled the ice cream up. So it started out with the idea to make an ice cream design that I wanted to move. And then I thought about what I would want to do, what the, the view A would be, what the view B and what the view C would be. I wanted to know, you know, what the different images would be. The stationary images, not necessarily the movement. Don't start with the movement. Start with the different ways it could be looked at. And I thought, you know what, it'd be pretty cool if I could do it with a differing number of scoops. So that was my plan. And then after I came up with that, then you can move on to how you would make it move. So if you look at kind of like my little setup on how to do it, you start out with your idea, which would be in this particular circumstance, an ice cream cone. And then you would sketch it in multiple angles or in the different stages of the design. Once it's completed, how you want it to look in the different, you know, the different moments. And once you have that out, then you can plan out the mechanics. And for this design, I made a big, the whole bottom of the nail, the whole lower portion of the nail was a pocket. And so the ice cream scoops could just fit into the pocket. And it looked a little funky because there was like these different levels of the nail. But at that point, that's, you know, how I was, how I could think of to do it. And so that's the mechanics. So you plan out the mechanics and there's different ways to do it. So now that I'm far more experienced in my 4D nail art journey, I would have not done it that way because like I said, it looked a little funky because it had this like big bump pocket. Think of um, an aquarium nail where you put two tips on top of each other and just looks kind of big and bulky and sort of clumsy. That's how it looked. And so like I said, that's not how I do it anymore. But now when you're going through that planning out the mechanics phase, that might be an idea that crosses your mind and you can keep it or you can keep thinking. And now I would keep thinking and I'd be like, you know what, I'm going to make the different scoops magnetic and I'm going to make it so that you can just add them separately and put them on, which now that I'm talking about this, I may have to do next summer because that sounds really cute. Or somebody else can do it and just, you know, send it to me and I would still think it was cute and it would be just as fun. But anyways, that's kind of how my thought process goes. And as I'm talking this out, I didn't have that idea before. That's usually how it goes for me. I just all of a sudden I'll say something completely out of the blue. Hey, wouldn't this be cool? I'm like, you know what? Yes, it would. I better write that down. So you plan out the you plan out the mechanics. You figure out how you want to go about it. In this case, like I said, it'd be magnets. Now, if you aren't if you haven't used magnets before or if you haven't made a pocket like I talked about originally, you're going to want to talk about it in your brain. Or on paper, if you're a paper person or if you're a think it out person, however, however you need to do it, think about it, think about it pre, almost like make it in your brain, go through the steps and be like, okay, first I would do this and then I would do this and see if you can find any spots where it doesn't work. And you probably won't because it's hard to find the spots that don't work until you're actually doing it, but you might find them. And if you do find them, then you can reassess and try to fix it. So you want to think about each stage. So I would know that, okay, if I'm going to do it with magnets, then in my brain I'm thinking, okay, so inside the nail I would need to embed a magnet for each scoop that I'm going to be wanting to be able to place on top later. And if that's two of them, then I think, okay, I need to place two magnets inside the nail. If it's three, three. And those are the kind of things that you have to sort of suss out before you get started because otherwise it's hard to add them later. And the more you can figure out and the more you can talk it through and think it through and draw it through, the better. So when you plan out the mechanics, really draw it out, if, especially if it's something new. So I'm going to grab, I have my notebook and I didn't pre-find a design in here that I drew out. But I'm going to see if I can find one really quick. Usually when I'm searching for a page, I just find one and I think back, I'm like, oh, that's so funny. There's a drawing that I did. I never, it's not organized and I should have found one of these before we got started. We'll see. If I can't find one right away, I'll find it later. Inevitably, I just did one too. Not aha, I saw it. Where did it go? Well, whenever I there we go. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to where you guys can see what I'm talking about. You guys get to see my other notes on here. So we're gonna focus this in. 
so you can see. So this is a single drawing that I did. This isn't like a multi-step thing. This was for my pumpkin, the, the sculpted pumpkins, the elegant pumpkins I did last uh, October. Oh, so pretty. Oh my goodness, I love that now. And I wanted to just sketch it up before I did it. So you can see it's a rough sketch and it just helped my brain materialize what I was planning on doing. And so when you do a sketch like this, this is one way to do it. If you wanna do it where there's multiple angles, I don't know if I have any like that in this particular notebook. I've kind of gotten away from doing it that way because I can think about it well enough in my brain because I have so much practice. But before I would draw it, so if you look at my finger, I would draw it from this angle, which is what this is, it's upside down. Be turn my hand over, it's like that. This part here is, is the finger. So I draw it in this angle. I draw it in the, the side angle. Depending on the design, you know, like I said, you draw it in more than one way. So it'd be each stage of the nail. And so you need to do that. You need to draw out every single thing you can think of that would make a difference. And if that's just one drawing, oh, here we go. Here's a better example. Okay, so this was, if you need to know, this was the um, Extreme 3D Spring Nail that I did that had this cute little cut angle shape with the branch underneath it and there's a bird. So this was the top view of the nail that I was thinking of. I'm like, how do I want this to look? So this is kind of what I had planned out. Like I said, rough sketches is fine. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be something that's, you know, worthy of being on a wall. It can be a really rough sketch. Um, and then this is what I want to look from the side view. These aren't 4D, but it's the same concept. You want to draw it in every angle and view that you feel like you need to until you have a really good grasp over what it is that you're doing. So now that you guys kind of got a, a little look at how to draw things out, then you get to test your plan. So you've, you know, you've thought out the idea, you've thought out how you want it to move, you've thought out the mechanics of it. Now you get to think about how to actually do it. You get to do it. You get to play with it. You get to use the products. You get to grab all your supplies. You get to make it and you get to see what you've been thinking about, what has been haunting your brain for the last two days or two months or two years, depending on how complex this design is, you get to put it into action. And like I said, it's sometimes it's two hours, two days, two months, two years, because I have had designs on my list of to-do lists for a very long time because I haven't figured out how I want to do them yet. And if that's the case and you haven't figured it out yet, give yourself time. There's no rush. It's, it's art. It can be slow. It can be quick. It can be messy. It can fail. And it's still worth the time, the effort, the thought, okay? Don't feel bad if it doesn't work the first time. There is a design that didn't that I tried four years ago, is how long ago it was. And I, I know this because I had planned it out at a festival that I was at. All I could think of the whole time was how this design was gonna work and it was completely fogging my brain. I'm like, I'm gonna figure this out. And I went home afterwards, I tried it and it did not work. And so it's been four, actually maybe even five years, and I still think about that one. And I'm going to try it again soon because in the past four or five years, my knowledge bank has grown incredibly. I've done so many other designs and who knows what piece of knowledge I've learned in the past five years that could make this concept that has been haunting me for the past however many years um, become possible. So if I do do that video, I will definitely reference back to this one to be like, hey, you guys remember us talking about nothing that nobody knew about? This is it. So yeah, so don't try to rush it, but once you're ready and you feel like you can do it, test it out, see if it works. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Maybe it'll work on the second time you do it. Maybe it'll work on the 19th time you do it. Maybe it'll work right away and it'll be a hugely exciting rush of, of endorphins because you figured something out and you get to do it and you get to experiment with it. And it's just, it's the best feeling when something new works and it's your brainchild. So, you know, that's kind of the, the whole goal is to do it. And like I said on the last bullet point, be prepared to change the plan because when you're working on it, the way that it's all planned out in your mind may not work. There are countless times when I quickly e-file something off or I change the position of something or I adjust it because it doesn't necessarily work the same on paper or in your brain if you're drawing in your own mind as it does when you actually go to do it. So that's kind of the, you know, the thing just to keep in the back of your mind is that you can change it as you go. You don't have to follow your plan to a T because plans change. So that's kind of the idea. So now that we've kind of talked through building a concept, which I know it's a lot of vague 
things that I'm saying because we aren't talking about something really specific. Um, so it's not, I guess, as helpful in a certain design as it it may be. We're going to look at some products that I use that maybe will give you some inspiration and you can be like, you know what, I could use that there. So we're going to look at some things. We're first going to start out with the nail products that are pretty standard. Um, I'm going to go through and we're going to just run through the list. I'm going to then show you guys some of the things that I personally use that I find more helpful for 4D nail art specifically than some other things. So we've got acrylic. If you watch my channel, you know I'm an acrylic person. I love acrylic. So there's acrylic, 4D gel, acro gel, builder gel, gel polish. So those are basically anything you can use that you can stick on a nail, you can use in one way or another to make 4D nail art. Nail glue, the infamous nail glue, nail form backings, and a manicure scissors. So I also, a tweezers isn't um, on that list. Sorry if I start sounding like a toad and I lose my voice. Um, uh, yeah, so a tweezers is also super helpful. And I might have stuck that in the not nails category, even though eh, it's kind of on the edge. So for the products, like I said, so the first ones I want to show you is I have double dip acrylic powder. And I have, I'm going to see if my camera can be a little happier. There we go. So you have double dip acrylic powder. And we have, well, I, I have a sticker. There's the price tag over where it was. This is the Young Nails. I don't know what they were called, but the Young Nails acrylic, they're color acrylics. So I just used this color in a video, in a stuff I was working on yesterday. And because I'm really behind on my schedule, it's a video that is hopefully going to be uploaded on Tuesday. So you can watch me struggle with this product. Um, double dip, and I know that you guys hear me talk about it all the time. I despised working with this. I wanted this specific color. I wanted that bright teal, so I used it anyway. But I didn't realize how spoiled I've been using the double dip powders because they work so much better. They're so much smoother. If your acrylic does not seem to be working for you, maybe it's not working for you and you need to find a different brand. This one, this Young Nails powder is horrible. And I mean, it works. It's okay. I got it done, but oof, it took me like four times longer than I was hoping it would. So there's that one. And then there's this Koopa acrylic. So this powder, the double dip is the stretchiest as far as when you're sculpting it, like you can just like pull it and stretch it into position. This one cracked and broke apart. Like it just didn't do what I was asking it to. The Koopa does stretch to an extent, not as much as double dip, but this Koopa Artfinity does not seem to be as strong. So the pieces kept some flexibility, which depending on what you're making, isn't good. It's okay for 3D nail art, but if you're looking for 4D nail art and you want pieces that are tiny and strong, this isn't it. So you know, acrylic in general, yeah, you need acrylic, but it might be one brand over the other. So for me personally, out of my collection, my favorite is going to be Double Dip. And like I said, I know you guys have heard me say that a bunch before, but it always stands true. So then we have, so that's acrylic. The next one I said, I just dropped my nail form backing, oops, um, is 40, or 40 gel. And there's two brands that I have just because they've been gifted to me through NTNA. I have the Wildflowers Lace Paste and the Glitz 40 Gel. So the Glitz 40 Gel is a little softer than the Lace Paste. Ooh, that color is neon. Um, it's a little softer, but it works. The Lace Paste, I actually like a lot better, but you can kind of tell, if you guys can't, that the Lace Paste seems to like hold its shape a little better. This one, the edges of it are a little softer in the container. It's so bright that my camera's blinded. We'll see, but it kind of just, yeah, so that's sort of the idea with these. Um, you can sculpt things with them. It's almost like using Play-Doh. So depending, that can be really good. Really thin things, you cannot make really thin pieces with this. And depending on what you're trying to make, sometimes you need to make something really thin. And then for Builder Gel, when I'm doing stuff for 40 Art, typically I use Builder Gel as a strengthening element, depending on what it is. Um, I like to use a Builder in a Bottle. The gel bottle is the one that I just use all the time. It's the one I use on clients, and it does the job. If you want to know more specifics on the different types of gel, I have a past live class that just goes into every single kind of gel I could think of and when to use which one, what they're good for. So gel polish you would use in 4D nail art when you want something that has a little bit of mobility to it, a little bit of flexibility. 
So I like Madame Glam gel polish for this because it keeps the flexibility. And if you want something to be flexible and thin, gel polish is the tool for that as far as nail products go, whereas other products aren't. So if you have a gel polish that cures and becomes kind of crispy like a potato chip, it's not going to do what you need it to do. And then last but not least, one of the last few things on this is obviously nail glue. This is pretty self-explanatory, gluing things together. I also have my Flash Gear flashlight. Depending if you're like holding two pieces together of your 4D piece, you can just flash cure it quick, hold it together, and then pop it into your lamp if you're making it with gel. Uh, this one is Wildflowers, but I have heard people say that you can find these significantly cheaper on eBay. I think if you look for a urine finder flashlight, um, it's kind of a good thing, but I think if you just look up UV flashlight, you'll find them but they don't have to be advertised for nails and it does the job. Okay, we've got my collection of tweezers that I mentioned. I like to have a variety of them. I like to have an angled one that have these flatter, almost kind of not too pinchy of an end, a little bit softer of a grip so that I don't crack something. And then I like to have these pointy ones for picking up really little things and moving them around. So it's nice to have a couple different ones. And then I also like to have, this isn't a tweezers, this is a nail pincher, a pinching tool. So like if you're sculpting, you can hold and pinch the nail to deepen the C-curve. I never pinch nails. I never um, have enjoyed that. But I have a pinching tool and it can sometimes help to hold things together while you're waiting for them to dry or cure. So those are always a good thing. A manicure scissors, self-explanatory, and then a nail form backing. I'm going to grab one. So this is what a nail form backing is. It's essentially sticker paper. I use them all the time, and a lot of times people don't know what they are, and I say a nail form backing, and they still don't know. So this is a nail form backing. It starts out as a nail form. This is a nail form, just in case, you know, we don't know. And a nail form is used to make a nail enhancement without using a plastic nail tip. And after you peel it off the, the backing, there's this beautiful sticker paper that looks like this. And you can sculpt your pieces on top of it. So if you're making a box, you can sculpt all the sides of the box on top of here. And then you can put them together and they just create these beautiful flat pieces. So you can sculpt anything you want practically on a nail form backing and you can make it. It is one of the most useful things. And there was a while where I didn't have any clients that I did sculpted enhancements on. And so I never got nail form backing. So anytime I did have one, it was like gold to me and I saved it so long, but now I've got a whole cabinet full of these because I have clients now that use them. So I get them so more frequently and I still hold on to them like they're precious metals because I use them so much and they're so important to, you know, creating these 40 things. So those are like the nail, the nail type of products that I use all the time. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the not nail things that I use constantly, which is the most exciting part. And there's tweezers right on the top of the list, even though just shifting in my chair, my foot was falling asleep. Um, tweezers, like I said, they're on the edge of whether they're nail or not nail. So we're going to talk about those things that I showed you guys in the beginning. And I know a lot of you probably weren't there for it because I forgot to advertise this class very well. But I have a little kit on my online store that includes some of these things that are not nail products that if you want to just grab, it's a good little sampling. It's kind of like a little beginner's thing. If you, you know, want to try some 40 stuff, but you don't have the supplies, you don't want to, you know, run to 16 different stores and spend an arm and a leg to get a bunch of stuff. And you just want to get a little bit of a bunch of things, then it's a good little option for you. I can show it to you again. So that's the kit. Um, it has a pipette. It has some seed beads, magnets, bar beads, and those wires with the loopy on the end. I don't know what they're called. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to our not nails. Okay, so tweezers, I already showed you guys those. We know tweezers. Jewelry wire. There are so many different gauges of jewelry wire that it's hard to purchase that without looking at it and feeling it, I think. But jewelry wire is what you want for doing this. You don't want something that is like a copper wire or a, like a, hardware type layer because depending on what they're coated with what the metal is when you put your acrylic and whatever you know gel on top of it sometimes they they might corrode or not hold up to the the chemicals that we're using whereas jewelry wire is just a little more 
durable in that environment. They're a lot of times made to be used with resin, with casting resin, and that type of resin is essentially gel. It's just like our our gel, our hard gels. It's a, the same product, but one has got a cosmetic label on it and one of them doesn't. So as far as like chemical breakdown goes, they're essentially the same thing. So you don't have to worry about the wire breaking down in that environment when it's made for it. And then there is seed or sand beads. Seed beads are slightly bigger than sand beads. And truthfully, you probably want seed beads, not sand beads. So I'll show you, I'll show you those all in a minute. Um, thread, super useful to use thread. I love using thread in different things. You can make nice little hinges because it's flexible and it stays flexible. It holds on to the products really well. A gazillion colors that you can pick from. There's just so many uses for thread. Pipettes, that's one that took a little bit for me to find. When I was originally hunting them down, I searched high and low because usually they're far larger. And I wanted to find teeny tiny ones and I don't even remember where I got them. Somewhere, some website on the internet and it's been a while since I got them. And I was so excited when I finally found those pipettes and when I'd been searching for days to find the ones that were as small as I wanted them to be. So pipettes, um, that is what I use to create something that oozes. So the most recent oozing video I think I have, I've done different things like where there's um, water or hand sanitizer inside the little vessel of the pipette and then you insert it underneath the nail and you squeeze it. And the first one I did was an eye that looked like it was crying. So cool, and I've done like bleeding skulls, I've done a bleeding heart where you can put some fake blood in the pipette and squeeze it and then it bleeds. All of those cool oozy things are what you want a pipette for. And um, they're just a little plastic pipette like you used in science class in sixth grade, but they are tiny, they're so tiny. Um, and then straws, straws are, well I'll show you in a second, but I have a collection of straws. Whenever I find a a straw someplace that's a different size, I keep it because I don't use it because I that would be like cross-contamination and gross to have a straw that somebody drank out of. <laughs> so I don't use it and I keep it and it goes in my collection. And I use them for sculpting anything that has to be circular and hollow. And you'd be amazed how often that particular need comes up. So straws of as many sizes as you can get your hands on. And then a mailer bag, which is probably the most unusual thing. And I actually have some more stuff over here that I forgot to put on my list that I will show you too. So really quick, I'm just going to read a comment so that I don't miss it. So this is from C. Ann Taylor. I've been watching you on and off for the past five years, and you are absolutely hands down one of the most talented nail artists I've ever watched. Keep up the good work, and I'll be watching. Thank you so much. That is so sweet, especially anytime like somebody's been watching me for five years. I was just talking not that long ago about how, how much I look at my work from five years ago and think, ooh, I could do better. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. All right. Time to look at some not nail products. I'm gonna take a drink so I don't lose my voice. We're gonna start with the mailer bag because I think that's the most surprising. So this is, if you're in the United States, we have the United States Postal Service and they have these priority mail mailer bags available and they don't cost anything. So you can just walk into the post office, do your, you know, buy stamps or whatever it is and you can grab one. And I've been using the same one as long as I've snatched it. Um, we just actually keep a bunch of them in our house because we mail stuff all the time. And so what you can do is you can see this material. It's thin like paper, right? It's, it's thin, but it doesn't tear. You can't rip it. It does not rip. It does not tear. You can write on it. These are meant to be write on so that you can address them. So it doesn't rip. It's water resistant. You can write on it and it's thin and flexible like paper. So this particular material is so unique and so necessary for what we do if you want something to have like a little piece of paper in it. Say you're wanting to make a four dimensional little notebook that opens up and has pages in it. If you use paper, the first time it gets wet, it's gonna be ruined and it might rip and it's just not sturdy. Whereas if you use this, it holds up. And so the one thing is, is underneath it, it says, thank you for using priority, priority mail services. So you have to sort of cut between the writing, but we don't need very big spaces usually when you're doing nail art stuff. So I've always had plenty of space cutting in between the lines. So this is <clears throat> one of those things that, like I said, this is products that I use in 40 nail art that you wouldn't necessarily immediately think of. When I was trying to find something that was this material once, and then I mailed something and I grabbed one of these, 
I jumped up and down. I was so ridiculously excited because I had found the answer to so many questions in these priority mail mailing envelopes. It's just a mailing envelope and it is the best thing since sliced bread. So get yourself one of these and just keep it in a drawer somewhere because you can keep using the same one over and over and over again. So here's something that I forgot to put on the list. This is aluminum foil. Sometimes you can also use like plastic saran wrap, plastic wrap or plastic film. Recently, and I don't know if they've changed what plastics are used in it, I find I have a really hard time peeling my acrylic off of it. So in my past few videos that I've needed to use something like this, I have been using foil instead of the plastic wrap. So usually when I'm doing this is if I have a nail sculpted and I want to sculpt something on top of it that fits the nail perfectly but isn't going to be on it where it's stuck, you can wrap the nail either in plastic wrap or the aluminum foil and they'll stick down. So hypothetically, back to the beginning of this live class when I said I would do ice cream and make different ice cream things that would um, come off, you would sculpt them so that they would fit perfectly on top of the aluminum foil with a magnet inside. So there'd be a mag magnet inside the nail, in embedded in the nail, then you'd put the aluminum foil on top, and then you would put another magnet on top of the foil. It'll just like snick, it'll just snick right down on top of it, and it'll go to the one underneath. And you can sculpt the ice cream scoop on top of it. And then once it's cured, it'll just peel right off the piece of aluminum foil. And then you have a piece that'll fit perfectly to the nail, but isn't attached. So that is where aluminum foil comes into play. Next, we're gonna look at our straws. I have four of them here. So we've got our four straws. They're all different sizes. Straws are a plastic straws like this. Unfortunately, it's something like a silicone straw. I don't know if that would work and I honestly would be afraid to ruin one of my silicone straws finding out, um, but just plastic straws. And I am kind of an anti-plastic straw person as far as just my normal everyday life. And so the thought of, you know, using them here is sometimes kind of um, against my environmental beliefs, but I'm using them repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And so I find it okay, but I kind of hate advocating for plastic straws. And I know there are certain countries that they're illegal and there's certain states in the United States where plastic straws are illegal. And if you have a hard time finding them, then contact me and I can get you some contraband plastic straws if, if you need them. Um, but like I said, I hate advocating for plastic straws and yet here we are needing them for our art form. Well, yeah, so here we go. And <laughs> Misfits 225, yeah, I forgot to advertise this class, so it was like a surprise pop-up class. So don't worry about it that you <laughs> almost missed it. We're still just in the beginning here. But here we go. So we've got these plastic straws, vital and super important. Stir sticks also work well. I have some of those too. I just forgot to grab one. And they're going to be more narrow than this straw. So you can get a whole bunch of sizes of these. Okay, the next one that's not advertised on my list um, we have, oh yeah, so Sarah J said that she uses C-curve pipes when they're the right size. Yeah, that would work too if you're not, if you don't have plastic straws. Although I don't think that they go down quite as small as some of the straws do because they, like a pinky C-curve isn't going to be quite as tight as some of those straws, but that would definitely work. Um, so here we have, we have all of these other tools. Okay, back my brain just took a vacation. All right, so we have a floss pick. That's the word that I can think of. So I use both ends of this. I use the pokey end whenever I need a poker and um, this part of it too. So if you have acrylic and you wanna make lines in it and it is in that beautiful matte but still pliable stage, you can dip this into your acrylic powder and then use it to cut the acrylic going down. And unlike using a craft knife like this, it won't cut you because it's just, it's just floss. You know, it's, it's thread, but it's held taut and you have to replace these fairly often. I would say maybe, I don't know. I've actually been using this one for quite a while. This Plackers one is a little more sturdy than some of them that I've used before for this purpose. So you just have to kind of press into it. Once the, the thread, if it starts, the thread of the floss, if it starts to fray and look fuzzy, or if it gets really loose, you can't use it anymore and you probably have to replace it. But otherwise, you can keep using the same one a bunch of times. And so depending on the design, these are really helpful. I usually don't 
think I'll need this until all of a sudden I'm like, oh no, I need my floss pick. And I'll dig through my cabinet as a mad woman trying to find it before my acrylic sets up. So anytime you see me using one of these in a video, know there was about 15 seconds of panic before I located it right before that moment. Otherwise, depending on the circumstance, if you need to cut something, definitely a craft knife is the way to go. Same thing, you're going to want to dip it in acrylic powder before you try to cut acrylic because otherwise it'll stick. And as you can see on the end of my blade, I have some acrylic residue that is stuck. And if that ever happens, I take, I have a cuticle pusher that isn't one of my good ones. It's one that is kind of, eh, and you can scrape the acrylic off of it. I'm using my nail. <clears throat> Don't use your nail. Nails are jewels, not tools which I have to remind myself of all the time. So there's a craft knife, which can be helpful. Okay, here's a pipette. I have everything just kind of in a mess next to me. So here's a pipette. This is what I was talking about that you can create oozing designs with. They are, this one is the smallest one I could find when I was searching for them. They're usually used for baking. Like you would fill this with say caramel sauce and then you would stick it into a cupcake. And then when the consumer were to get the cupcake, they would pull the pipette out and they could squeeze the caramel sauce over the top. And it's just kind of an experience thing. But that, that's why they're usually so much bigger because this would be like, what, barely a taste of caramel? You wouldn't even know. So they're usually a lot bigger than this, but they fit. You can kind of tuck them under the nail where they hide underneath the finger where you don't see it. And then when you're ready to freak somebody out, you can squeeze it. And like I said, whatever is in it will ooze out and come out hidden holes in the nail. So that's where a pipette would come into play. Then if you're doing an aquarium, this one probably is going to be like the most self-explanatory thing, a syringe. Um, this is a syringe that the, is actually from medication. This isn't one that is, uh, it's a syringe I salvaged. Um, but you can use it to fill an aquarium or anything that you need filled up whether it's an aquarium or like a snow globe design. This is, I've sanitized this by the way, it's been fully cleaned and scrubbed and all of that great stuff. But the one thing I like about this one versus the ones that you can buy is the needle is so much smaller than, cause I've seen some people that have bought syringes that are meant for like craft purposes. I'm pretty sure you can get them on Amazon. Um, but it seems like the needle's a lot bigger and it's probably fine. But this one I feel like, especially if you're trying to get it to go underneath the nail and you don't have much space that this one just kind of sneaks in there a little bit easier than those bigger ones would I don't know maybe if you've used them before it's fine but I like my little free salvaged syringe so we've got a syringe that's not something that I have in my kit that is uh, for sale but you know it's one of those things that I know you can get elsewhere I just don't have extras of them to offer you guys then we have magnets which um, where do you get this syringe? So I think Amazon or eBay. If you look up craft syringe, you probably will be able to find one. Okay, so now we have the magnets. These magnets are so tiny. When I sell them, I sell them in sets of 10 and they look like nothing because 10 of them is like about that long. It's, I didn't count those, but that's about, you know, the length that 10 of them is. And so if you grab one, it is so, so small. And not only is it small around in a circle, I'm going to try not to let it connect to the rest of them. It is very narrow. It's very thin. Um, and so it fits inside the nail without adding any more bulk to it because there's the natural thickness that, you know, the enhancement has to be. And depending on where this is, when you fit it in there, you don't have any issues with it. You don't even know it's there because it's so thin. It just fits right in. So, um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head what size these magnets are. It's on my online store. And so you would, you could look at that there. I have the, the size of them listed. It's some ridiculous number. It's, they're tiny. But these are also, one thing I want to mention is these are rare earth magnets. They, there's different grades of magnets and you want them to be rare earth because, um, yes, I do have a website to order from. And if you go to the top link in the description box below where it has the, the little kit from today, I think you should be able to get to the rest of my store. Um, I don't advertise it very much, so you probably wouldn't know. So these, 
yeah, like <laughs> lose them in a second. I always keep them in this little box. Um, rare earth magnets. You want them to be rare earth magnets because that's going to be stronger. And they're so small that if they aren't that really strong, powerful magnet, they aren't going to hold anything because they're just tiny. And what, you know, what good are they going to do? If they're like the grade of a refrigerator magnet, it would be unfortunate, but nothing would, nothing would stick. But these little puppies are actually really effective. They don't want to go back in their box. So yeah, I have, this is probably several hundred of them, but it doesn't look like it could be because they're just so tiny in there, but it's so many. Um, I think the last time, I think it's probably close to 500 in there. So yeah, so <clears throat> those are the magnets that I use in my videos constantly. These are the little wires that is in that kit that I showed you. So they have a little loop on the end, which you could just cut off if you didn't need it. Otherwise, there are times when that little loop is super helpful. I know that um, there have been, I so I use, I only use these when I need the loop because otherwise I just use wire that's on a spool. But you wouldn't have to, if you just want to have one wire product, it could be these. And this is a jewelry making wire. My ring is, I'll turn around. Jewelry making wire. It's got a little loop on the end. It's like for making dangly earrings so that they would, they would hang down from the post. Otherwise for wire, I use this kind and it's, let's see if it's 20 gauge wire. So we've got this one. This is my thicker, stronger wire that I use when I need something that's gonna hold up. It's probably, these little wires are probably about the same. Yeah, I think these are the same gauge. So these are probably 20 gauge wires too. And then the other wire I use is this one. And I can't tell you what the gauge is on it because the little paper that said is gone, but it's way thinner. It is so thin and it is so bendy. Like it takes no effort at all to bend it. And so you can do some really nice shapes with it. You can have a lot of fun with this, but it also breaks easier. If you bend it too much, it will weaken the wire and it will have the possibility for breaking. And so if you're going to be using wire, you have to have, you, you or you may want to have a couple different gauges so that you can choose the best wire for the best, for that circumstance. Okay, so there's the wire. And typically when I use wire, I end up using it with some beads. This is the set of beads that I use in my videos most often. I a lot of times will use these ones that are kind of clear. So these are glass seed beads. So what they are is they're just teeny tiny little glass beads. The sand beads are, I don't know, half the size. They're so small. But these seed beads are about the right size for doing nail stuff. So we're going to open this. Up really carefully otherwise they fly everywhere. I'm gonna grab one of my tweezers. So if you can grab one, you know they're they're really small and so you can use them for hinges. So when you make a hinge you're gonna take you're gonna take a bead and you're gonna take a piece of your wire. I'm just gonna grab one of these that's in the kit or two. One of these you're going to place the bead onto the wire. Okay, I'm going to actually grab, these red ones are slightly bigger, so they're going to work better. So these red ones are the ones that I'm including in the kit, by the way. I'm giving you the guys, the one, I'm giving you guys the ones that work better. Okay, so you can slide the red bead onto the wire. Okay, now if you're making something with a hinge, you glue the wire to one side. Glue and then secure it. Secure it with gel, secure it with acrylic. So the wire gets stuck to one side and then the bead, just the bead, gets stuck to the other side. So like if you have a box, you'd attach the wire to the box. And then if the box has a lid, you would attach the lid just to the bead. So then as you open the lid, the bead turns on the wire and it opens up. I hope that that makes sense. I've done that technique in so many videos and I usually just like <coughs> rush past the technicalities of it. I try to explain it in the time I have, but you know, I don't necessarily take a huge amount of time, but that is how you do it. So you make sure that the wire and only the wire is stuck to part A and the bead and only the bead is stuck to part B. And then it should work. It might not always work because you know, as you open it, maybe it'll get stuck on something and you have to take your e-file and carve a little way at the back and then try it again. It's a lot of trial and error making things this small be functional. So like I said, 
you know, when you go and you do something, be prepared, be prepared to change the plan or at least just make adjustments as you go. So there are the beads. Now, if you're making something that's like a box with a lid, these bar beads are actually a little nicer because they create a little smoother working of a hinge. Unlike the seed beads that when you open the lid, it can kind of wiggle back and forth because it's just that tiny point that's on the wire. If you use one of these bar beads, which is the same basic thing, if you use one of these, then when it's on the wire, it can't wiggle left and right. It can only open, open and close because the extra length stabilizes it. So I haven't been using these nearly as long. I just found them in a drawer. And so I was like, hey, that would solve a lot of my problems. So these are great. So I included a few of these in that kit too. So we've got those. And all of these beads, if you know, if you are just wanting to go get a whole bunch of them and just dive headfirst into making 40 nail art, craft store like Michael's or Hobby Lobby, Joann's would have this type of thing. Otherwise there are some jewelry making specific stores, not anywhere near me, but I know that there are some, some like bead warehouses that would have so many options for you in this type of a category. So beads are something like this that I use all the time and I call them seed beads, which is what they're called. And I know I've gotten people say, well, what are you talking about a seed bead? This, this is the creature that you are hunting. All right, we're down to just, I think this is the last thing on my list of supplies. We have thread. I personally like to use, oh, I dropped my spool, um, upholstery thread. It's a lot heavier than your other thread, so it's a little bit more sturdy and durable depending on what you're doing. But I do use regular weight thread as well. But the upholstery just seems to just grab things a little easier. You know, it's not going to... If you accidentally file it with your file, it's not going to break right away, which other thread is a little bit more fragile and it'll, it'll break on you. But this stuff is pretty, pretty durable. So I think that's pretty self-explanatory for thread, depending on, you know, what kind of a design it is that you're doing. And any of these things, if you want to see, you know, designs using these products that we just talked about, if you, if you just look in the YouTube search bar and you type in hot pink zebra polish, 4D or 4D nail art, you will find so many designs where I have used these products. And I hope that, you know, you can use them to get inspiration for making your own 4D designs. And really quick, I've got a bunch of past nail art next to me. I'm going to just grab a couple 4D designs and I'm going to show you guys and talk about how I came up with them and different ways that they work. So I've got a couple here that some of these are not gonna be YouTube videos because they were commissioned for somebody else to make into videos, but we will look at those. And some of these you guys probably have seen already, but I'm just gonna grab a couple. All right, this should do it. I had intended to grab these before we got started, but nine o'clock came really quickly tonight. All right, so we're gonna go back to the tabletop all right, so the first ones that I'm going to show you are the ones that, you know, aren't going to be YouTube videos because I can't, um, I'm just going to, aren't these cute? Look at that. It's adorable. So we've got this little mouth. It opens and closes, right? Okay, so opens, closes. If you look in the back of it, it's going to be hard to see because I like to try to mask. I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so if we look at the mechanics, there is a wire here, a little teeny tiny wire. This is the finer of my two wires, the one that I said is kind of wimpy. So I've got the little teeny tiny skinny wire. We don't want it to really, you know, be seen. So that's where that little wire is. And then that wire is attached to the lower jaw. Then on the upper jaw, we have the other bead. We have the bead, which is hard to see because I covered it with acrylic on the outside. If we open up the mouth and we look in there, it kind of looks like the tonsils. In the back, we've got that little tiny bead in the back. So now right now you can see that's as far as this opens up. The first time I made this, it barely opened at all. And I was like, oh man. So then I looked at it. You have to figure out where it's getting stuck. So I looked at it and I'm like, where is this getting stuck? And then we're going to flip this back around. Right here, it was getting stuck. The acrylic was getting, you know, caught up on itself. So I took my e-file with the tiniest bit I have. And I just very cautiously carved this area out, not hitting my bead, 
not hitting the wire, just right there. And then it opened up a lot farther. So now before when I was talking about a, when you would use a seed bead versus a sand bead because sometimes the seed beads are a little wiggly. If you look at this, the jaw wiggles back and forth. You know, kind of, it kind of like turns some. If you didn't want that to happen, you'd have to use one of the bar beads. I didn't have the width in order to use one. And it's the same thing when it's opened. You know, it kind of has some wiggle back and forth. A bar bead would make it so that that couldn't happen at all. So there we have a time when you would use a bead in that way. I'm going to close that. The next one I'm going to show you is this mermaid tail. We can zoom out a little bit. So this is a mermaid tail that um, is just like the one I made for NTNA. Um, so it's got, this is a gel polish spine that's in it. And then this is all Acrogel, but the 4D element of it has nothing that isn't nail related. It's all made with nail products. And it's just the fact that we're relying on that gel polish to bend so that the tail can move back and forth. That's the technique of it. And so that's a circumstance where you're not using anything that isn't nail related but you're just knowing that your gel polish is going to bend and relying on that and utilizing that flexibility to make this little wiggly tail that you can make go back and forth. These next ones are ones that you've probably seen if you watch my channel religiously. We've got this, this is, oh, I love this one. Okay, so we've got a, the astrological moon phases. So our, 40 element is this spinning moon. So all we need, all I needed is for it to rotate. So what I have is I have a wire that goes down the entire back of the nail. And my whole goal, like I said, was for it to rotate. And so then there's a little bead at the top of the moon and a bead, actually an opening at the bottom. I had intended to put a bead at the bottom and then it was just too hard to get the wire to perfectly go through both beads. So I knocked the one out of the bottom made the hole a little bit bigger and it worked out. So that's a circumstance where my plan changed and I just had to kind of roll with it. Like I said, happens all the time. And if you allow yourself the possibility of changing the plan as you go, life will be a lot less stressful. So we've got this just spins, it turns, it rotates. So it's so shiny and so spherical. <laughs> so that's, um, you know, again, beads and wire. That's probably the biggest thing is just beads and wire and those lovely little magnets that I use all the time. I should have found a magnetic design. I know I've got one up there. Okay, next on the list, we have another circumstance of just wanting something to rotate. This is my snowflake video. Oh my goodness, can you guys see? Every time I look at this one, I just get caught up in the dimensions that are stuck in the nail. It is so pretty. Okay, getting distracted now. Again, snowflake, we just wanted the snowflake to be able to rotate. So it's the same kind of idea. There is a wire, and then we attached everything to these beads. And then it'll just rotate pretty freely. If your beads fit on your wire snug, if they fit, but it's not like a really loose thing, then when you spin it, like you can't um, just flick it and it'll spin around, 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 around. It'll, you know, spin a little bit, but it'll also hold its position, which I prefer. If you want it to spin faster or do it a little differently, then you'll have to have slightly larger beads or slightly smaller wire, which, you know, again, is just a trip to your craft store. Just spin that around. Oh, I could do this for like hours. Just watch it go around and around and around. Mesmerizing. Okay, before I get too distracted here and everybody goes to sleep. Last one, again, beads and wire. We just want this to move. A lot of, a lot of things are trial and error. This one is when my trial and error was at first, my Santa and my reindeer spun, like they would just do circles. And then I figured out that if I just bent the wire, because there's a wire that's holding them together, if I just bent it a little bit, they couldn't spin, which was all that was needed to make it so that they didn't just get seasick on their, on their sleigh ride reminds me of the Grinch when he goes, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna throw up, and then I'm gonna die. That's, that's when I was watching him just spin around and around, that's what I was thinking about. We don't want that to be the case. So just, you know, a little tweak is usually all it takes to make it work, if it's for whatever reason not working. So now let me just see if I can find something with magnets really quick. Oh, I've got another one to show you that opens. 
It'll be a good one. I don't see anything that I've done that's magnetic up here. That's just craziness. I don't know. Well, I found two other good ones to show you. I know I've done stuff with magnets lately, so who knows. So this is the, back in the beginning of the video, for those of you that were here then, I showed you the sketch I made for this nail, and this is how the nail turned out. So I'm just going to see if I can find that sketch again, because it's kind of interesting to see how my sketch looked compared to how the design looks. So I would say it's, I mean, it's really similar, but you wouldn't necessarily think one led to the other. Melody scribbled in a whole bunch of my notebook. Yeah, I'm not gonna find it again. Oh, there it is. See, right when I threatened not to find something. Okay. So here we have, here we have the sketch that I made for this nail. And you can see it. So I drew out the top view, and here is the top view. So you can kind of get a perspective of it. At first I was thinking of putting some flowers down here, and then I decided that you could kind of see the ones from underneath through, so I didn't actually attach any to the that part of the nail. So my, my little notes are scribbles, which is usually how I do things. So here's how that looks. And then from the side view, here's my sketch of the side view. So I've got that shape of the nail coming down. I've got the branch coming down, the little bird. So that's kind of how how my sketching process works. If I do decide to sketch something, it's usually really rapid and without much um, forethought. It's just getting what's in my brain out of my brain. And so then we end up with this nail with all those different kinds of flowers in it is what got made. Not four dimensional, but just really cool. If I if I do say so myself, it's kind of four dimensional just in the fact of it's unwearable and extreme, but it doesn't move. So then the last one I'm going to show you guys is one that I used those bar beads for instead of using a seed bead. So it doesn't wiggle, which you guys will see. So if you open it up, it opens, but it doesn't wiggle. So it doesn't like tip back and forth whatsoever. It's really nice and secure. So if you ever are doing something where you want it to be like this pizza box, it would look weird if the top of the box tipped back and forth. So again, the wire of this hinge is stuck to the bottom of the box and the bead is stuck, stuck, to, <laughs> stuck to the lid. And that is, you know, just, just how it is. So that's how you got to do it. And then at the back, you can see where the wire is just super helpful. Um, to get kind of a closer look at how these things are assembled. So now that we've done this, this whole class where we've looked at products that I used, we've gone back and looked at some past nail art. Next month, we're going to be doing some of these. We're gonna do a technique. We're gonna do one 40 technique. We're gonna do a 40 design, start to almost finish, at least the 40 element of it. We probably won't do like finished painting um, live, but we're going to do a 40 design in next month's class. And I personally am really excited for, for that. And you know, a lot of this class kind of hinted towards hinges, but I'm going to do a poll on my YouTube channel in probably a month, not a month. The class will be in a month, less than a month actually, because this one was late. Um, a week, we'll do a poll and we'll do a question of if we want it to be something that is magnetic with these adorable little magnets in it if we want it to be something with a hinge, like the pizza box, if we want it to be something where it spins, like this snowflake, or last but not least, if we want it to ooze with a pipette. And so I'm going to ask everybody, and if you want to have a stake in this whole thing and decide what it is that we're doing, then let me know. And then after that, depending on what it is, if I have like a few designs within each category that we could do. I'll probably do a second poll once we have the tech, the 4D technique or concept down of uh, what the actual design is. Cause I mean, if it's something with a hinge like this, I did, I showed you guys two designs. I, we have a mouth and we have a pizza box, completely different, you know, styles. So 
we're going to find something that you guys want to watch, I want to make, and that will have a really fun time putting together next month. So come back in January, definitely. If you're interested in that kit, um, like I said, I only have a couple of them. I have 15 of them made up. So if you want one, that's the only 15 I'm going to be doing. And it's only going to be available for about a week because they're products that I will only keep aside for so long and then I got to declutter and I got to put them all away. And once they're put away, I'm taking it off the website. So there we are. If you want one of those, uh, grab it. Otherwise, you know, if you want to just go to your local jewelry store and, you know, grab a basket and go to town, definitely do that too. And if you want to be part of my future live classes, I usually am much better about sending my email reminders and I will, there's a, uh, my email address is in the description box below. So go and send me an email to that email address, hotpinkzebrapolish at hotmail.com. And I will add you to the list and you will get an advanced supply list of what you will need to do next month's class, which sometimes isn't that big a deal. Like today we were just chit chatting. There was nothing that you really needed to have out. But next month when we make something that's 4D and you guys are going to be making it with me, you're going to want the reference photos and you're going to want, I'll probably, depending on what it is, I'll pre-make some templates for you. You're going to want the templates and you're going to want to know what it is that you're going to need. Are you going to need magnets? Are you going to need little pieces of wire? I don't know, but you will probably need to know. And once I know, then you will know too. So that stuff is all going to be important things. So if you aren't on that email list and you want to participate, get yourself on the email list and we will see you next month. I'm so excited for these live classes to continue into the new year. This has been the 12th one. I started them last January and it's just so crazy that I've, you know, this the 12th one. I don't know how it happened so quick. I feel like this is still just a new idea for me, but I have been having so much fun doing them with all of you. So yeah, I can't wait to see you guys. See you guys next month with this.